bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. We say to you, O Lord, you are our Lord. We have no good apart from you. Father God, we confess that we are sinful and we tend to wander off into territories you abhor, whether in our own thoughts or deeds. Please have mercy on us. If Jesus was not our righteousness and redemption, hell would be the place best fitting for us because of our misdoings, shortcomings, unbelief, and love. If Jesus was not by the power of his spirit our sanctification, we would be without hope. We are thankful that you have woken us up this morning. We know that it is not by might nor by strength but by your will that we get to see this day, the 14th of November, 2021. Our Father and our God, we are so thankful for the means of grace that you provide for us each and every single day. We are thankful. We are thankful for this local church, St. James, and all that you do for this church. Speaking of this church, please be with Pastor Jock, Lord, as he concludes the high priestly prayer series, of which we have, of which we have and are still learning much from. Lord, death is such a painful thing and none of us will ever get used to it. However, death for a believer means gaining heaven, and therefore, we are thankful for Anne Dowie's life, and we are thankful that she is now safe forever in your glorious presence. Please be with her children, Jonathan and Diane, and the rest of her family in their time of mourning, as we know that you comfort the brokenhearted. As the local ministry needs around the Free State continue, we pray that you may help us raise enough finances in order to address the needs presented by our local ministries during this month. Oh, Father God, remember our country. South Africa is going through so much, but we know that the gospel is the only hope. And so please give us the boldness to proclaim your word for your glory. I ask this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Morning. Let us pray. Jesus prayed this prayer to the Father as he lifted his eyes to heaven. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I have made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Dear Heavenly Father, we magnify your great name, Lord, for the work that was done on the cross by Jesus, our Saviour and Redeemer. Thank you for the sure and secure love of the Father that we can know and the presence of God's Spirit to help us live this earthly life. We do not stand alone. Emmanuel God is with us. Please help us to understand the power of the cross where the Father glorified his Son. He was made a man just like us, but as he was obedient to the Father, Jesus, the Son of God, was glorified through his death and resurrection. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice so that we could have eternal life with God in glory. Sometimes we forget that our time on earth is limited and we have seen many in our community taken from this life. We grieve the loss of a dear, faithful member of St. James and Dowie. We pray for comfort and strength for her family, especially her children, Jonathan and Diane. We rejoice as followers of Jesus that we should have no fear in death. As the song goes, in Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What hearts of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. This month is Missions Month, and we pray for the needs of our family of churches, Emmanuel in Blumanda, 
Christ Church in Valcom, Holy Trinity in Bochabello, and St. Paul's Church in Jubiton, all with practical needs to help improve their ministries to the people in these areas. May we contrib contribute to strengthen our local churches in their service to God. We thank and praise you for your provision for our needs, and we ask you to help us to support those in deepest need. We ask all these things in your glorious name, Jesus. Amen. The reading is taken from John chapter 17 and verses 24 to 26. Hear the word of the Lord. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning from my side, and um, welcome to St. James this morning. We, we started a couple of weeks ago with this series in John 17 by asking some personal questions. We sketch or ask you to imagine a scenario of where you were about to die. And then we ask a couple of questions around that. And the questions we asked were, um, who would have priority in your life during that time? Who would you want to spend your last moments with? Who would you want to pray for in that time? And, and what would you pray for them? Jesus is about to die. He is about to step over the Kidron River, a river that would have washed down and out of the city the, the blood of the Passover lambs who were prepared for the day. He is about to step over that river into Gethsemane where he would be arrested, where he would be tried later and then sacrificed as the Passover lamb. He spent his final moments with those that he said is his family. These are my brothers and sisters and mother. They're my family. And he's about to die. And as he looks at the Kidron River, about to step over it, he lifts up his eyes to heaven and he prays for his family. He prays for his immediate disciples, those who believed and followed him while on earth. And he prays for his future followers, those who would believe their message, the message of the gospel throughout the ages and become part of his family. He prays for us, those who believe in Jesus, in him. And what he prays and why he prays is what is dear to his heart. He prays that the Father will glorify him. Why? So that his disciples may be, may be in an intimate relationship with the Father and with Him. That is dear to Him. That is His desire. That is His want. That His followers would be in an intimate relationship with His Father and with Him. He prays that the Father will keep His disciples. Why? So that they may be one. He prays that the Father will keep His disciples from the evil one. Why? So that they may remain in the world as people of the truth. And proclaim the truth and live out the truth. He prays that all the disciples will be one and will become perfectly one. Why? So that the world may believe and know Jesus and the love of the Father. Jesus' heart is for his family. And that heart for his family is also a missional heart. He loves them and he wants them to express that love. Through word, through deed. Now this morning we come to the final petition of Jesus' prayer. A petition in which he expresses his deepest desire. That his family, his followers throughout the ages, may be with him where he is. So let's pray and let's ask the Lord's help as we consider his prayer. 
Lord Jesus, thank you for this prayer. Thank you that you prayed this prayer for those dear to you. Thank you that you prayed this prayer for those who would become dear to you. Those the Father gave you. Thank you for your prayer for us. As we consider this last petition, help me to proclaim your word faithfully. Help us to hear your spirit speak to us through your word. And may we see you more clearly and worship you more dearly. In your name we pray. Amen. So Jesus' desire is to have his followers with him where he is. Verse 24. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be where I am. Now Jesus desires, and that word there in, in Greek, is, it's a very strong word that speaks of what he wants. So he expresses his deepest want to the Father in this last moment, before, the, before he would be arrested, before he would be crucified. That want, that desire, is his will. That's a strong language that is used here. It is His will. And it is His will for you who believe in Jesus. He wills for you to be with Him where He is. His desire is for you to be with Him where He is. Now, those whom the Father gave to Jesus are those who have believed in and followed Jesus. And His deepest heart's desire which is his will, is for them to be with him where he is. Now that's tremendous. That's tremendous. This is not only an expression of his desire, but of his will. What Jesus wills is what the Father wills, because they are one. What this means is that those whom the Father gave the Son will certainly, absolutely, be with Jesus where Jesus is in heaven because it is God's will for those who believe in Jesus. It's a certainty. It's absolute. It's God's will. And God's will takes place. Now consider for a moment that last phrase, maybe where I am. The emphasis of this phrase is not so much on the where, where Jesus is, but on the fact that Jesus is there. There is heaven. But like many other scriptures, many other passages in scripture that speak of heaven, the emphasis is always not so much on, on, on heaven itself. The emphasis is on the most important thing about heaven. Jesus is there. God is there. That they may be with me where I am. That's the emphasis. Jesus. Now, I love thinking about heaven, don't you? I love thinking, spending some time, you know, around the table and, and just thinking with my sons and, and, and with Lindy, you know, what, what heaven is going to be like? You know, what are we going to do there? Um, you know, and scripture gives us enough information just to make us curious, doesn't it? About heaven. And we wonder what it's going to be like. What is this, this renewed earth going to be like where sin is not present and where the new Jerusalem will be and where Jesus will be? What is that going to be like? Are we going to work? Are we, we are definitely going to recognize one another. What, what's that, those relationships going to be like? Can you imagine a relationship with someone where sin is not present? Can you imagine working where sin is not present? It's not a slug anymore, you know. Slug, slug. Anyway, it's, it's not that hard anymore. It's, it's a pleasure. We enjoy it. It's great. We, we're taking part in working in this new, refined, renewed earth. Relationship where sin is not present. What's that going to be like? I cannot imagine it. It's going to be wondrous. But as much as I love thinking about heaven, I love thinking about the fact of what it's going to be like to be with Jesus. To be with Him. Have Him walk beside me. Me walking beside Him. Talking. And the Bible and God's Spirit helps us to know Him. What He is like. Who He is. How He is. But still, we only see as if through a stained glass here on earth. 
So we wait, don't we? We wait eagerly in anticipation to meet in person, physically, the one whom we have known since we placed our faith in him and grown to know him and grown to love him through scripture as his spirit enables us to see him and gaze upon him through his word and pray to him and commune with him. We wait eagerly anticipating for that day when we're going to see him face to face. Like a bride, I, I would imagine. Like a bride waiting in anticipation to be with her bridegroom and be with him for the rest of their lives. We anticipate being with Jesus for all eternity. Yet, what's amazing about this verse, what we see here in this prayer, is that he, the bridegroom, is the one desiring, is the one anticipating, is the one willing for that day that you will be with him for all eternity. Like a bridegroom waiting for his bride to step into that perfect unity for all eternity. Jesus desires. He desires that. Which brings us to why, we, why Jesus praised us. He prays that you will be with him where he is to see his glory. The glory that the Father gave Jesus because he loved Jesus before the foundation of the world. What is that glory? Well, in verse 5, Jesus prays to be restored to the glory that he had with the Father before the world existed. See, it is the glory of the pre-incarnate Christ. The glory of him as God the Son before he entered into this world as man. The glory of Jesus that we will see is his glory as God. In the last book that John wrote, Revelation, he writes about this vision that, that he was shown of Jesus in this glorious state in heaven. And he hears a voice behind him like that of a trumpet. And, and then having turned, he saw the voice that was speaking to him. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed, with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp to its sword. And his face was like the sun shining. In full strength. It's like John is grasping for words to try and explain what he is seeing. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But this amazing sight that he's seen that is almost dreadful. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I live forevermore. I am alive forevermore. I am the first, I am the last, I am the Alpha, I am the Omega, I am the beginning, I am the end, and I died. And behold, I am alive forevermore. See, the glory of Jesus is His glory as God. The glory that He had before the world existed. But there is something different to that glory than what it was before. In Daniel 7, Daniel sees a vision of Jesus when he was exalted to the throne, taking up his rightful place after his resurrection and ascension. And he, and he first sees a vision of the Ancient of Days. Let me read it to you. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from by, before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. And then Daniel sees someone approaching the Ancient of Days. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. 
And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. What Daniel saw was the exaltation of Jesus after his resurrection and ascension. Now did you notice, in both Daniel's vision and in John's vision, they saw one like the Son of Man. And this is the one difference to the glory Jesus had before the world existed. There is now a man in heaven. There is now a man in heaven, one like the Son of Man, who is God the Son and His name is Jesus. See, Jesus sees His humanity as part of His glory. That is why He can pray that they may see my glory that you, Father, have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. See, part of the glory that the Father gave Jesus is His humanity. John speaks of this in chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen what? We have seen His glory. We have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. See, we will see the Son of Man, who is God the Son, and we will behold His glory as God and Man. Now, that's tremendous. Because what this means is that Jesus had carried humanity, human nature, into the very presence of a holy, righteous God. He carried human nature into the, before the presence of God. This means now there is not only a place in heaven for the divine, but there is also for us. For men, for women, for children, in the presence of God, in Christ Jesus. He is there now, and because He is, we know that we know that we know that we know, we who believe in Him, we will be there too. He is the first fruit of many, the first fruit, the first human in many, of many, that will come to heaven. Those who would believe in him. In the final two sentences of Jesus' prayer in John 17, Jesus, once he surveys his work towards those that the Father has given him, and he focuses his attention not only on his past work, but also on his continued work. Verse 25, O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Now Jesus stands in contrast to the world. The world does not know God the Father and did not recognize Jesus as the Christ, as God the Son. But Jesus himself knows the Father fully and made him known to those given to him by the Father. They are the, they are the ones who would would come and, and know the Father for who He is and know that the Father sent Jesus to them, to this world. That He is in fact who He claimed to be, God the Son. Jesus says that He has made the Father known while on earth. But He also says, I will continue to make you known. After this prayer, Jesus will make known the extent of the Father's love through the cross. You look at the cross, what do you see? You see the extent of God's Father, the God the Father's love for you, shown to us through the cross. After this prayer, Jesus will make him known, and, he, and after his resurrection, Jesus would appear uh, over a period of 40 days to more than 500 people and continue to make the Father known. After his ascension into heaven and his exaltation to the throne, both the Father and the Son will send the Holy Spirit, and Jesus will continue to minister through the Holy Spirit in us and make the Father known. Through the agency of the Holy Spirit, Jesus continues to make known the Father. As the Spirit leads us, and through those who believe in Jesus, 
Jesus continues to minister and show who the Father is and proclaim who the Father is as the Spirit works through the disciples to the rest of the world. Jesus continues his work to make the Father known. And the gospel is preached and we see the extent of the Father's love for us in the cross. The immediate disciples, they wrote. And we have their word before us in the New Testament. And in that sense, Jesus continued to make the Father known. And through us, as we proclaim the gospel, Jesus continues. He hasn't stopped working. He continues to make the Father known. To what end? To what end? This was strange to me when I read it. And if you look at the last verse, verse 26, to what end that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them? To what end? Love. Love. Love in action. See, in this very last phrase, Jesus shows where we can demonstrate love. For he prays, the love you have for me may be in them, and that I myself may be in them. See, love is to be shown in us, those who believe in Jesus. Now, so why is Jesus so concerned about this? Well, simply because it is only in the followers of Jesus that anyone since Jesus' ascension into heaven till today and into the future will be able to see this kind of godly love expressed. A love that forgives. A love that prays for an enemy. Forgives an enemy. A love that shows mercy and grace. Godly kind of love. Expressed in action. Concern for one another. Praying for each other. That's godly kind of love. So Jesus will not be physically here for people to comprehend and to contemplate. So he says that this love, this godly love, is now to be in us. It is the kind of love that the Father has for his Son, and the Son has for the Father, and for those that the Father has given his Son. That kind of love. That's divine love. That's godly love. And it's to be present among us. So with Jesus in us, that love is ours. We experience it. We have it. And we also express it amongst one another and to those around us. The last evening that Jesus spent with his disciples, it started in chapter 13 of John. Do you know how his time with them started? It started with a new commandment. Just after Judas left the upper room to betray Jesus, Jesus says in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. I find it interesting that Jesus ends his last prayer, same theme, love amongst us and him in us. How will they be able to love one another in this way so that the world may know that they are Jesus' disciples? Through the answer to this prayer. 1726. That the love with which you, Father, have loved me may be in them and I in them. 1 Corinthians 13, the love passage, shows the importance of godly love in all we do. In all we do. Think about it for a second. What happens when you take love out of some of the characteristics of the people of God. Subtract love from holiness. What will you end up with? Self-righteousness, won't you? Take love from truth. What will you end up with? You will have a bitter orthodoxy. Take love from mission. What will you have? Imperialism. Take love from unity, and you end up with tyranny. But express love, 
in relation to God and man, and what do you find? What does love for God, the Father, lead to? Joy. Because we rejoice in God and in what He had done for us. What does love for the Lord Jesus Christ lead to? Leads to holiness because we know that we will, will see Him one day and be like Him. Therefore, everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as He is pure. What does love for the will, for the, for the Word of God lead to? Truth. Because if we love the Word, we will study it and grow into a fuller appreciation and realization of God's truth. What does love for the world lead to? Mission. We have a message that we want to take to the world. What does love for our fellow brothers and sisters lead to? Unity. Because we love, by love, we express our oneness in Christ Jesus, in a Christian community. Through followers of Jesus today, Jesus, through the indwelling Spirit, continues to make known the Father as they speak from God's Word and as they express godly love to one another and those around them. Every single aspect that Jesus prayed for in this prayer has been answered by the Father and so will this last petition. Why? Because this prayer is not merely a prayer, but it's an expression of of Jesus' heart desire, His will. And His will comes to fruition. And His will is perfect in alignment with the Father's will for the other one. You will, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, see His glory one day. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you for this prayer and the time that we could have taken and set apart on Sundays this past couple of weeks to meditate, to think about, to pray through, to consider. Thank you for this prayer. Thank you that we could see your heart in this prayer. Thank you for how you've ministered to us by your Spirit as we considered you through this prayer. Lord Jesus, by the work of your Spirit in us, the continued work that you're doing, may we grow in our appreciation for you, your word, your heart's desire for us to proclaim truth and to love in a godly way. Move us, Holy Spirit, for your glory's sake we pray. Amen.